Hey everyone, I hope that uh, this Friday has been a productive day for you. I hope that uh, you're looking forward to uh, the weekend. And today we're going to be finishing up this week's study in Genesis chapter 34 in our Gen 1 to Revelation 22 project. You know, I was thinking as I was driving back uh, from work today, uh, from over work in Illinois uh, today, I was thinking of how, you know, we've been doing this. We started in Genesis back in March, and here now we're in chapter 34. And I think that's just such a testimony to how much God's Word has to teach us. It's a living Word. There's so much for us to dig in and, and explore and so many gems to mine. I think mining is a good analogy of how we approach studying Scripture. There's, there's always more to learn. None of us know it all, but we have the Lord's Holy Spirit. We have His Word, and He, he teaches us. Today we're going to be looking at murder and rebuke. Murder and rebuke. Yesterday we started off Genesis 34 and we saw that Jacob, Jacob's daughter Dinah was raped. She was raped as she went to the city of Shechem. And we talked a lot about the significance of that city in Israel's history. I shared a link about it. And uh, we also looked at how... Shechem is a type, a, a symbol of the world, kind of like even Sodom and Gomorrah was. And we talked about the differences in how Jacob is handling this situation compared to the past. But we ended in verse 13 last time. That's where we're going to pick up today. So if you join me, if you're in a place where you can get out your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 34. We're going to start in verse 13. And uh, we're going to walk through the end of this chapter. If you're driving, because some of you have told me you do drive while you watch this, uh, well, not watch while you listen to it, is what you've told me. You better not be watching it. Um, just wait to open your Bible till you get home. Be safe while you're on the road. If you can listen, just like you listen to the radio, that's fine. All right, let's start off in verse 13. Now the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully. Because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. When we will give our daughters, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. Verse 17, But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do this thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will these men agree to dwell with us to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the city, out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were sore, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me a stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, verse 31, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? What we see happen in, in our text today is that Jacob is not the one that answers 
this man who has raped his daughter and this man's father. They're coming, they're trying to give a dowry, they're, they're willing to do anything in order to get Dinah as the wife of this donkey of a man, this armpit of a man. We looked at the meaning of their names last time. Shechem meaning shoulder, and his father's name Hamor meaning dirt or clay or even donkey. And so I used the, uh, I referred to them yesterday as the donkey of the man and his son the armpit. Because it kind of really describes what type of men these were. And names do have a significance in Scripture. Let me read to you a, a couple of the meanings of the names of the characters here in this, this part of our text today. Dinah, daughter, uh, Jacob's daughter, her name meant judgment or who judges. His two sons that led the raid. Levi means join or attached. Joined or attached. When Leah bore Levi, she said, Now my husband will be joined to me. She was hoping that by bearing a son, finally Jacob would stop pining after Rachel and would love her. Simeon means God has heard that I wasn't loved. The name Simeon also means obedient, listening, or little hyena, ferocious little hyena. These two sons of Jacob initiated judgment. It's, it's very interesting that Dinah's name meant judgment. And when Shechem took her, judgment came. Now, it was not a righteous judgment. It was a murderous, hateful, vengeful, revengeful judgment that Jacob's sons meted out. But in verse 13, we see the sons of Jacob answer Shechem and his father. Jacob does not. They say, here's what we'll do. If you circumcise all the men, then we'll become one people with you. Our tribes will become one. We'll dwell in the land. We'll become one country. They deceitfully say, we'll compromise if you become circumcised because that was the mark of being part of God's chosen people. If you were a man, circumcision was the right, so to speak, or the symbol, kind of like, you can kind of liken it to baptism today. Baptism is a symbol of the fact that we are followers of Jesus Christ, an outward symbol to the world. Circumcision was a symbol that these men are the descendants of Abraham. The Jewish men circumcised themselves. They were circumcised uh, upon birth. And Ishmael as well. Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham. To this day, Ishmael's descendants, the Arabians, many Muslims continue to practice circumcision because they point to the covenant God made with Abraham. And that covenant was sealed by the outward sign of circumcision. So they say, come on, join in being God's people in a sense, and we're going to you know, become one nation with you. They deceive them knowing that after three days the men are going to be very sore. They've undergone a very painful operation. They're not going to be in any condition to get up and fight. And so two sons, just two sons of Jacob, Levi and Simeon, rise up with their swords and kill every male of the city. Every single one of them. Now the interesting thing is that very, well immediately in verse 18, the words that Jacob's son said about, you go get circumcised, pleased Hamor and his son Shechem. They were pleased with this. They went back and they pitched the idea to the men of the city from the city gate. Hey guys, all you got to do is be circumcised. These wealthy men, all their flocks, all their herds, they're going to become ours. They, they really pitched a good business proposition there. You know, you let them marry your daughters and you marry from their daughters and we're going to become one people and all the wealth that they have, their eye was on their wealth, will become ours. They deceive the city. So we see double deception here. The deception on the part of Jacob's sons because they want revenge for the fact that their sister has been defiled. And yet at the same time, deception on the part of Hamor and Shechem to the rest of the people in the city. And on the third day when they're tender and they are in pain from the surgery that took place, 
that is when Jacob's two sons rise up, Dinah's brothers, and they kill all the men. They kill Hamor, they kill Shechem. They hate these men. And they take back Dinah, who has been taken into Shechem's house. And they go away. Then the sons of Jacob. It appears that now the rest of the sons of Jacob come join in the party, so to speak. And they come upon the slain and they plunder the city. Why? Because they want revenge. They feel they deserve it. Their sister has been defiled. And I talked yesterday about how, how hypocritical these same men would be because we will see Reuben takes his father's concubine. He commits immorality in just a few chapters ahead. And Judah is going to commit incest, not knowingly. He's thinking he's committing an act of, of hiring a prostitute, but neither is a moral thing. These very men that that want to execute judgment upon another because of immorality that's taken place, they themselves are going to practice immorality in just a few chapters ahead. Showing, once again, while Jacob's life is beginning to change, he is responding more patiently and not irately like he always has in the past. I think it's a picture of his salvation, that God is beginning to work on him. Jacob's not perfect. We're never perfect as believers this side of heaven. But there's this process of sanctification, becoming more and more like the Lord, becoming more patient, becoming more self-controlled. Fruits of the Spirit in our life, not fruits of our willpower. Our willpower will fail. The Spirit of God can empower us to change. What we see happen, though, here is that Jacob's sons plunder the city. They take all the wealth, and they also take all the little ones and the wives and all that was in the houses. They captured and they plundered. Then in verse 30, Jacob rebukes Simeon and Levi. Basically, it's like a dad saying, What boneheaded move did you make, sons? You're not being wise. You, I'm putting it in paraphrase. You just attacked the city and destroyed them. The other Canaanites are going to hear about this. They're going to come after us. We're just a few people. We're going to be destroyed. And their only answer in verse 31 was, Should our sister be treated like a prostitute? No, their sister should not be treated like a prostitute. But they could have dealt with the situation differently. Instead, they allowed their anger to turn to revenge and murder. The Lord Jesus says that if you hate someone else, you have committed murder in your heart. It, the Bible also says, Jesus also says, if you lust after a woman, it is the same as if you committed adultery with her, men. By that definition, we have a very humbling and, and very sobering picture of humanity. That means every single marriage is made up of two idolaters and, and two fornicators and, and two liars and two murderers. Because the honest thing is, can anybody honestly say they've never lusted? Can anybody honestly say they've never hated? Jesus levels the playing ground and shows us, levels the field and, and shows us, we are all dead in trespasses and sins. Sometimes we want to exalt certain sins as worse than others. There are certain sins that are, um, I think we could say based on Scripture, more vile than others. The Bible says that as men grow more depraved, they will turn not only from sexual immorality to homosexuality to bestiality. And we're seeing that sadly in our nation today. We're seeing people try to pass... Uh, pedophilia being legal. These are horrendous sins. But the truth is, all sin is sin. There, It gets more and more vile. The fruit of one sin is more sins. We see here today a sad picture of Jacob's sons and how they're living. But I want to also give a glimmer of hope in chapter 35, where we will pick up next time. Jacob begins to be the spiritual leader of his house and says, Hey, we, you need to prepare yourself to meet God. They're going to go to Bethel. 
which means the house of God, they're going to worship. And he says, get rid of your idols. And basically, he says, repent. He's going to talk about specifics that were symbols, outward symbols of inward repentance. To kind of recap some applications, we've looked at the scripture. Remember our SOAP acronym for, for studying scriptures. scripture, S-O, observing the text, A, applying, and P, praying. A, applying the text. Let me share a couple things. This passage brought to mind as I was uh, reading over it a couple times this week. One, when we commit sin like we see in this passage, when we look at Jacob's sons, they felt that they were justified for what they did. They thought that their sin was justified and that it was rational. But the truth is, sin is never justified and sin is never rational. But so often when we go do something, we try to justify it. We know it's wrong, but we try to justify, well, it's right in this case. And we try to give a rational reason for why. But the truth is, sin can never be rationalized away, and it can never be justified. I think that's a powerful application we learn from this passage that applies to our lives every day. I think we also learn something about the patience of wisdom. Jacob is holding his tongue in the middle of this. His sons are the ones that answer and speak. We don't see Jacob speaking in, in this chapter. He's not lashing out in anger. Now say what you will about that. Some are going to point to that and say, Jacob's just being a coward. Well, not necessarily. The scripture speaks a lot that if a man holds his tongue, he will appear wise. It, it, when we are going to say something out of anger, what did your mama tell you growing up? My mama told me, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything, right? That may be. The text is not completely clear, but that may very well be what Jacob is doing here. The main focus of this chapter is not Jacob. The main focus is what happens to his daughter and how his sons respond in their deception and their quest for revenge. We also saw something about, once again, the meaning of name is being so significant. Dinah's very name meant judgment. And the testimony of her life really was, was this. This is the one major story we have of what happened in her life. We don't really hear anything else about her. We're going to hear a lot more about her brothers. And what we see happen in this passage also foreshadows what happens through the rest of the scriptures and even down to this day in the Jewish nation. There are the 12 tribes. There is division there is a hypocrisy. Oh, we have the law. Oh, we're Abraham's people. Oh, we're God's people. We're chosen ones. Yeah, but you, they did not go out. The Jewish people did not go out taking the word of God, the message of the one true God, to the Gentiles like they were supposed to. They were supposed to be a light and a witness and a testimony. They did not live that. Brothers and sisters, if you would join me in prayer, as we close today, I think we've seen some powerful principles about sin in this passage. And also, we learn more about the story of Jacob's life. And very soon, Jacob's going to kind of pass, to the, go to the sideline on the story, and it's going to switch over to his sons. As the covenant that God had made with Abraham continues to move forward through to new generations, again, Generations that aren't worthy of it. But in spite of the fact that they're not worthy, God is faithful to His promise because He is going to bring the Messiah through this people. And He is going to begin His church through this people to take the gospel to all nations, every tribe, every language, every people group. That is why God in His sovereign plan is so patient with the Jewish people because God is faithful to His promise and His covenant and He has a plan to take the truth to all people. Father, we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your mercy. Father, we look at this passage and we see Levi and Simeon 
wanting revenge and and honestly it seems just justly so they they want to bring back honor to their sister they want to get revenge for what has been done to her she has been raped she has been used and abused by this man and now this arrogant armpit of a man wants to marry her and is brazen enough to come to them and say he will pay whatever dowry they want because he loves her oh yeah you really love her then why did you do what you did was it love or lust that probably was going through their minds but father we learn sin is never justified and it can never be rationalized away father I pray the Holy Spirit, you bring conviction where it needs to be brought and encouragement where it needs to be brought. Take your word, Father, and as your word promises, it will not return unto you void. You will accomplish the purpose and plan for which you sent it forth. As Isaiah 55 says, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for another week. We pray you continue to lead and guide us, Lord, even this weekend. And Father, as we continue on, until the day that you either return or call us home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.